Hello, and welcome to the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. I'm your host, Benjamin Douglas, and this is the show where each week I read a chapter from a different indie author. Thanks for joining me for today's reading. Hi, happy Friday, readers and writers. As always, this is Benjamin Douglas welcoming you back for another episode of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. And thanks for being here today with me for episode number 18, 18. Today we'll be featuring the work of indie author Roberta Kagan, who writes primarily World War II historical fiction and um, historical romance. And I'm going to be reading from her work today as part of a multi-author promotion that's happening over the next couple of weeks in conjunction with the release of the Christopher Nolan-directed film Dunkirk. If you've been watching TV, you've seen some previews for this. It looks like a really well-made war film. Christopher Nolan, for anyone who um, doesn't know, he's a director... Uh, one of my favorite directors right now, who kind of came on the scene with Memento. I really got on board with The Prestige. Uh, He also directed the Christian Bale Batman trilogy and um, Interstellar, a really beautiful science fiction film. A lot of people know him for Inception as well. Um, So he's doing some exciting blockbuster work and he has this film Dunkirk coming up. So, this week and next, I'll be reading from World War II historical fiction authors, beginning this week with Roberta Kagan. And I have a little spiel to read um, regarding this promo. This was drawn up by Alexa Kang, friend of the show, from whom I read a few weeks ago. Um, She writes, While we anticipate the upcoming release of director Christopher Nolan's summer blockbuster movie Dunkirk, The authors of the Facebook Second World War Club have joined together to invite readers interested in World War II to more riveting tales beyond Dunkirk. From July 21st to July 27th, more than 40 World War II fiction authors will discount their books to 99 cents to bring you back in time to witness the harrowing experience as well as stories of courage, bravery, and sacrifice in a war that impacted the entire world. This is a great chance to discover new books. Twelve of us are currently running a rafflecopter giveaway for this promo. During the promo period, we'll also be giving out, by random drawing, audiobook and print book prizes, including a copy of Andrew Levine's Dunkirk, The History Behind the Motion Picture. Please note, Andrew Levine, the publisher William Morrow Paperback, and the movie Dunkirk are not affiliated with us in any way. You can find out more about the Dunkirk World War II epic book sale by going to http colon slash slash alexakang.com slash dunkirk dash book dash sale and watch our promo trailer on YouTube. Thanks, Alexa. All right, um, so there are a couple of links there. One is to the landing page to the Dunkirk Week World War II Epic Book Sale, and the other is to their promo trailer on YouTube. I will, of course, be including those links in the show notes, along with links to Roberta Kagan's Amazon author page and her own website. So go to the show notes at http colon slash slash thebookspeakspodcast.wordpress.com for links to all of those. So an exciting sale over, uh, well, it sounds like 40 books each for 99 cents. Uh, (laughs) Go spend 40 bucks. (laughs) But seriously, if if you have any interest at all in um, historical fiction, historical romance, World War II, or if you just want to stay up on what's coming up in um, cinema and you are inspired by Dunkirk, go check out this sale because 99 cents a pop, you know, not too much to pick up a couple of these books. One of the books in the sale, of course, is Roberta Kagan's All My Love, Dietrich, which is book one of the series, All My Love, Dietrich. 
And it's from that book that I'll be reading today. Now, I want to read, as I always do, the author's Amazon author bio. So this is Roberta Kagan's Amazon author bio. I am an American author. My father was Romani, and my mother was Jewish. When I was very young, I learned about the Holocaust. I couldn't understand how something like this could happen. So I began to research and learn more. I met with survivors. I even met with children and grandchildren of SS officers, but I still had no answers. I cannot say that I have all of the answers to all of my questions, even now. But what I do know is that soon all of the survivors will be gone. Their message must be remembered. The sacrifices that they made must not be forgotten. And so I humbly and with the utmost humility, I try to tell their stories. It is painful, but I must convey the darkness and horror of the time. However, I also want the world to know and celebrate the unsung heroes. Because there were many ordinary people who acted in heroic ways. I realize that writing these books is a great responsibility. I pray every day that I am able to do this correctly. I am trying to reach out and touch many people, not with the message of the horrors, but with the promise of hope. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for considering my work. It is an honor that I never take lightly. I send you many blessings. Roberta. How's that for an author bio? <laughs> very, um, very poignant, I thought. When I read that, I was really sort of taken aback. You know, it, it's funny, some things... I, um, I'm a lifelong cynic confession time. And sometimes when I start reading something that's very heartfelt, my first inclination is to kind of cringe and say, oh, why are you, you know, this is oversharing. Why are you saying all this? By the time I was about halfway through reading Roberta's bio, um, that had completely shut down inside of me. And I was really caught up in her just honesty. Um, if this is marketing, <laughs> And you got to kind of say that it is because it's an Amazon author bio after all. It's brilliant marketing because it's really heartfelt, it's raw, it's honest. And uh, a couple things I noticed, she didn't drop any links to a mailing list or a Twitter account or anything like that. Um, not that there's anything wrong with doing that. I mean, I do that in mine. But it would have seemed a little trite, wouldn't it have, um, in the midst of talking about honoring the memory of Holocaust survivors. Um, so uh, a really moving um, epithet, I feel, in Roberta Kagan's Amazon author bio. So I wanted to share that with you. Roberta Kagan has a number of titles on her Amazon author page, 12 books coming up, and they're not all in the All My Love Dietrich series. There are five titles in that series. There are other series as well, such as the Michael's Destiny series. And um, I'm just kind of taking a cursory glance here, but it does look like everything is World War II related. Um, so if you're if you're into this at all, you should definitely be checking her out. She's got lots of high positive reviews. Um, she's got a couple of titles that are bestsellers with the Amazon bestseller tag. Um, so definitely worth checking out. And this title, All My Love Daytrick, as I mentioned, it's going to be 99 cents during this promo run. Um, and it's, um, it's an interesting, the way that it's structured is interesting. Some of the chapters are quite short. In fact, I think most of the chapters are quite short. But there are like over 100 chapters <laughs> in the book. <laughs> so you, you definitely get your money's worth. It's a good long read. Um, but because the chapters are so short, I actually read chapters 1 and 2. But then before that, there's a quite lengthy prologue. And so, um, oddly enough, for length of time for the show, I only read about half of that prologue. So you're going to get a chunk of the prologue, and then you're going to get all of chapters one and two today from All My Love, Dietrich by Roberta Kagan. 
Um, I hope that doesn't throw anyone off too much. I think it works pretty well because the prologue is all in the past when the protagonist, Diedrich, is a child. And then chapters one and two, he's a young man. So we kind of leap forward in time, and it's sort of, there's a nice divide there. Yeah, um, so it wasn't long ago that we lost, you know, the last survivors of the greatest generation. I do see occasional interesting stories about both Holocaust survivors and um, an interesting group of people, survivors who are still under investigation for Nazi war crimes. Um, people who, as very young men, were, you know, guarding um, concentration camps and young SS officers and the like. Um, and that generation is fading fast, too. Uh, most of these people are, like, in their 90s now and um, probably don't have long for this world. And the people who are telling these stories um, at, with some degree of firsthand experience, like the children of survivors, they're also um, quite elderly. So it's a fascinating time, I think, to delve into World War II as history because it is sort of removed, right? Like, it is a while ago... We've had a lot of events happen since then. In the global scheme of things, of course, modernity began in, you know, the age of reason. Sure. In a narrow scope, I kind of feel like the world we live in today began post-World War II. We tried to make it happen post-World War I with the League of Nations. That crumbled and fell apart largely because the Treaty of Versailles was kind of... Right? And all the resentment and the poverty combined with the nationalism and everything brewing in Germany. And then we have World War II and then United Nations, right? And um, I, I don't want to get super political or super doom and gloom because this is not a political podcast. But of course, it's, it's hard to deny that in the current political climate here in 2017, in much of the Western world, we're seeing a rise in nationalism a rise of discontent with our leaders, and um, maybe a rise in uh, the, the um, proclivity to blame the other, to blame other people groups, other uh, nationalities, ethnicities, or races. Um, yeah. And, and there's because of all the unrest happening in the Middle East, which, you know, that's nothing new, but um, <laughs> because of the like the Syrian refugee crisis and the ongoing war and turmoils there, there are plenty of the other coming into the Western world um, to be put under that microscope and spotlight. So uh, again, I'm not trying to make shadowy predictions um, just because that this isn't really the the forum for that, but um, I do think that understanding World War II and understanding what led to it and understanding the Holocaust is very important uh, in our current political climate, in, in this current time. Um, very, very important, not because I'm saying it's all about to happen again, but because um, history is doomed to repeat itself to those who don't learn its lessons, right? Who's, who said that? I don't know. <laughs> it's a famous quote. Um, so uh, there's my proselytizing for the day. Soapbox speech ended. Uh, but kids, you should know something about World War II if you don't. So um, without any further ado, we're going to hop into this reading. This is from All My Love Dietrich by Roberta Kagan. Do come back next week. I'll be reading from David Spiller's Girl at Dunkirk, which will also be featured in the promo. And starting next week on July 21st for a week until July 28th, look for that uh, sale of 40 books, 99 cents each. You can get a link to that in the show notes. Thanks and enjoy the reading. All My Love, Dietrich. Fourth edition published May 2nd, 2016. Book one of five in the All My Love Dietrich series by Roberta Kagan. Prologue. 
Berlin, Germany, 1923. Inga Haswell sipped steaming tea from a chipped china cup as she gazed at the second-hand bicycle. It stood with its front wheel slightly turned in the middle of her sparsely furnished living room. It seemed to be tilting its metal head and staring back at her. Her fingers, red and covered with open lesions from scrubbing, folded and unfolded a ragged dish towel. As the mild aroma of the tea wafted to her nose, she thought it more like hot water than tea, and she wished she'd saved a bit of sugar to sweeten it up. Sugar was difficult to obtain for anyone, but a doctor's wife she did laundry for gave her just enough for the recipe for her son's birthday cake. Today her son, Dietrich, turned seven. She shook her head and marveled at how quickly the years had passed. In her mind, she recalled the boy as he'd been a tiny infant, reaching up and tangling his small fingers in her wheat-colored hair. It had been so long ago, but to her, it felt like a moment. As she allowed her mind the indulgence of drifting into the past, her memory of girlhood returned. She'd been such a shy and sheltered child, with very little experience outside of her home. It had seemed strange to everyone that Hans Hoswell had shown an interest in her. She smiled. Had he really been so handsome before the drink had seduced him like an unfaithful lover and taken over his life? Dietrich resembled his father. In fact, both he and his sister, Helga, had their father's good looks. In her youth, she'd been slender with a plain face. Not ugly, just ordinary. Thoughts of Hans brought an empty ache to her chest. Once he'd been the brightest star she'd ever known, and such an athlete. Inga recalled the first time she'd seen him, he'd been playing football in the park. With his blonde hair shining like polished gold, he'd caught the sun's rays, seeming to light up the entire field. He looked over to find her staring at him, and he smiled a bright, white-toothed smile that had captured her immediately. Even now she recalled how foolish she'd felt, how her face had grown hot as she'd looked away in embarrassment. It came as a shock that she should have the attention of one of the most popular boys in school. There could be no doubt that he had his choice of girls, but he'd chosen her. She smiled at the memory, the skin around her eyes sinking into dark, cavernous crevices. They'd fallen in love that summer and married early that fall. Well, he'd fallen in love that summer, but her love had been instantaneous. Then the war came, poisoning the country's young men with dreams of heroism. Hans enlisted, leading a large group of his friends to follow. With the passion of patriotic conviction, he'd walked through the city wearing his uniform, inspiring awe throughout his neighborhood. Hans basked in the glory, reveled in it, in fact. Their friends and families hosted dinners where the liquor flowed freely, and toasts to his honor continued throughout the night. There she had been, right at his side, her heart swelling with pride. 
This brave and astounding man belonged to her, little insignificant Inga. The feeling had been so powerful and consuming that even now she could recall it as if it were yesterday. When his company marched out of Berlin, her world went dark, as if the entire universe had been lit by a single candle that now lay extinguished leaving only drifting smoke in its wake. She grew serious, unable to laugh, and had no heart to accompany her friends when they attended parties or picnics. Instead, she wrote long letters filled with emotion, holding them tightly to her heart before she sent them off to her beloved. While Hans engaged in battle somewhere far away, she worried incessantly. He'd only returned home on leave once, two years after he'd left. When she saw him, Inga cried and laughed and wanted to hold him so tightly that he would be unable to leave again. However, Hans had stayed for only a few days, but it was long enough for Inga to become pregnant. The war raged on, and friends and neighbors returned monthly from the battlefield, crippled or maimed. Then there was the unthinkable, those who were buried on the battlefield and did not return at all. Every night she knelt beside her bed, begging God to deliver her husband home safely. Hans was not there when his son was born. But Inga had been able to get a letter through to him to inform him he would be a father. She'd labored for sixteen terrible hours, but then, with the help of a midwife, She'd given birth to a little boy. She'd named the child Dietrich, and he became her reason for living while she waited and prayed for Hans, uncertain of her husband's fate. Dietrich was a good baby. He brought Inga back to life and made her smile. Finally, her prayers were answered. Hans survived unscathed, but not completely. Only his physical body remained intact. Germany had lost the war. Hans Hoswell returned from fighting an outside enemy, only to find himself fighting one within. Now he was at the bottom of a pit of scruffy, starving, unemployed men. Fits of unpredictable rage replaced the gentle words he'd once spoken to Inga. Haunted by visions of battle, he'd awoken nightly, bathed in sweat, the sheets twisted around his writhing body. Sitting up with a start, he'd cried out names she'd never heard. When he was awake, his hands shook, and sometimes he had trouble swallowing his soup, which leaked out the side of his mouth and onto his chin. Although his appearance remained the same, he had changed completely. Somewhere out in the fields, as bullets broke through the quiet of the morning, leaving his comrades torn to shreds in pools of their own blood, He'd been stripped of the confidence of the athlete she'd married and transformed into a frightened, troubled soul. When Hans first saw his son, he cried. It broke Inga's heart to see him so filled with emotion. At the time, she believed that he was overcome with love. However... The blessing of a child could not save Hans from his own tortured mind. 
it only added to the weight of his responsibilities. Even though Hans had no idea how to go about it, he knew he must find a way to provide for his family. He questioned his own worth. Instead of the fierce, protective provider instinct taking over, he sank even deeper into his depression. Accompanied by thousands of others who had returned from the war, he went out scraping and scrounging for work, only to find his way back to the local tavern in defeat. When Dietrich got an earache, he cried all night, and it only amplified Hans' sense of frustration. And Hans shouted at Inga, Get that child out of here! I can't stand it when he cries! Inga took the boy where Hans could not criticize him, and cradled little Dietrich in her arms, rocking him until he slept. From the moment Dietrich took his first breath and let out a lusty cry, she'd adored him. Now Hans and his aura of despair faded in the illumining joy the boy brought to her. Her little man amused her continuously as he held her heart in his little fist. Helga, Inga's second child, came later that year. Inga loved her, but nothing had ever captivated her as completely as little Dietrich. In a way, she felt that Dietrich had saved her. If Dietrich had not come along, she feared she might have taken her own life. However, the baby had only served to reinforce Hans's inability to support his family with a devastating effect. It broke what was left of his spirit, and he began to manifest a strong resentment toward his children. For a little over a year, he'd wandered the streets begging for spare change and seeking day labor. When he earned any wage at all, he drank most of it away to fill the vast emptiness within. Finally, with no education or skills, he'd chanced upon a bit of good fortune. Inga's brother had found him work as a janitor at the Hausladen Insurance Company. Although Inga felt they'd been blessed, Hans found the job humiliating. He could not accept the idea of himself sweeping up the day's mess or on his knees fixing toilets. She had also hoped that Hans would bring home money to help her with food and rent but he did not. Hyperinflation caused most wives to get their husband's daily pay in the morning and rush to buy food before the prices went up and the food was gone. But Hans did not allow it. He had his employer pay him his wages at the end of the day, at the value of the currency at the day's end, so he could take it to the tavern. As time progressed, his inner demons grew, and he lost interest in his family entirely. He thought only of the end of the day, when he would take his suitcase full of nearly worthless money and head for the only comfort he could find, in the bottom of a bottle. The responsibility to keep them from starving or being evicted fell entirely on Inga, who struggled to feed them by taking in laundry. She did not have time to wait in lines at the stores like the other wives, so she bartered her services whenever she could for food, taking cash only to pay the rent. Lost in her thoughts of the past and gazing out the window, 
Inga did not see seven-year-old Dietrich as he entered the apartment, returning from school. His aqua-blue eyes filled with light as he looked at the bicycle. Mama! He ran into her arms. Happy birthday, sweetheart. She hugged him and ruffled his golden hair as it fell softly over his left eye. For me? Really? He stared at the bike and then back at her in disbelief. Yes, for you. She kissed his forehead and held him close. Dietrich walked over to the bike and gently touched the handlebars. Then he walked around it twice and stopped to touch the seat, his eyes wide with wonder. Can I take it for a ride? Yes, but be careful. I know it is yours, and it is yours, but your father will want to use it sometimes to ride to work. Of course, only if that is all right with you. She knew Hans would take the bike whenever he felt like it, but she also knew Dietrich would never deny his father, and she wanted him to feel as if the gift were his. Of course, he can use it whenever he likes. Tears threatened to spring from the corner of Inga's eyes. She wished Hans could learn to love their son. If only he could see what a treasure God had given him in this generous and kind little boy. The door opened, and a lovely girl who would be four years old in November with long golden curls entered the room. Hi, Mama. Hi, Dietrich. Helga looked over at the bike. Is that Dietrich's birthday gift? Yes, dear, it is. Happy birthday, Dee. It looks pretty bad. She ran her hand over the dent on the wheel cover and frowned at the faded black paint. Inga shook her head, marveling at how different her children were. Dietrich would never notice the imperfections. And Helga, well, things had to be the finest quality to satisfy her. I think it's beautiful. Dietrich smiled at his sister. And when you get bigger, I'll show you how to ride. Thanks, Deet, but no thanks, she said, suspiciously eyeing the beat-up old bike. Can you ride it? Yes, I learned on Conrad's bike. Helga went to her room to change clothes before meeting her girlfriends in the courtyard of the building to play. Helga, make sure Heidi is down at the courtyard watching her little sister, or you come right back. Yes, Mama. His mother could not help but smile when she looked at the young face filled with joy. Now, I have to get back to the wash. Mrs. Reitman will be expecting me to deliver it by this afternoon. You two run along and play. And, Dietrich, if you are going to ride, try to be home by six. I've baked a surprise for you. I want to serve it after dinner. Your father will probably not be home until very late, but if he is not here, we will enjoy the cake without him, yes? With a wink of her eye, Inga assured her son that, regardless of his father's presence, his birthday would be a celebration. When she allowed herself to indulge in wishes, she thought of Hans. If only he would offer to carry some of the financial burdens of raising a family, instead of taking his daily wages to the bar, as he undoubtedly would tonight. If he made some effort, 
She might be able to spend less time scrubbing dirty clothes from early morning until late at night. Dietrich turned to Inga. I love you, mother. He hugged her. Thank you so very, very much for this wonderful birthday. I will never forget it. Ever. All right, then, my darling. You promise to be cautious? Now don't be gone too long. I will worry if you are. Inga held him tightly for a moment, inhaling the essence of him, then kissed the top of his golden hair. Put on your jacket. There is a chill in the air. Yes, Mama. I promise to be careful, and I'll be back by six. He cautiously guided the bike by its handlebars, down the staircase, and out into the bustling street. Chapter One Berlin, 1933 After the loss of the First World War, followed by the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, Germany plunged into a Great Depression. The country suffered both financially and psychologically. The people lost their jobs and their pride. Currency and food became scarce as the Germans searched desperately for a leader with ideas and conviction who would end their pain. The blow came down hardest upon the heads of the lower, working-class men. Many of those men had served in the army and took the loss of the war as a personal defeat. With their inability to scrounge out a living wage, they grew angry and bitter, searching for answers and someone or something to blame. Meanwhile, under the Weimar government, which was the government that was in place after the war, the country was making great strides in science and the arts. However, Germany seemed to have taken a hysterical descent into wild decadence. Vulgar entertainment and prostitution became commonplace. Political groups sprung up everywhere, promising a solution to the financial devastation, but leaving the people vulnerable and confused. It was a time of extremes. The cry for a hero sounded like a lion's roar throughout the land until it fell upon the ears of one who had been quietly watching and waiting like a spider in its web. Chapter 2 Are you still working for that Jew? Asked Conrad Clausen, Dietrich's best friend since childhood, lighting a cigarette as they walked home from school together. Charcoal gray rain clouds hung angrily over their heads, threatening to storm. Jacob Optenstern is a good man. He is more of a father to me than my own father ever was, Conrad. And furthermore, what is this with you and the Jews? Why are you so filled with hatred? My man, do you not see what is going on here? The Jewish bankers are the reason we lost the war. They take our jobs. They steal our money. Don't you realize that the Jews are the reason we're poor? Lying, cheating, no good bastards. Conrad, you're my oldest friend, and I care deeply about you, but I won't stand by and listen to you talk like this about Mr. Obenstern. He's my friend, too. He's your employer. Can't you see it? He owns the shop. You do all the work. Dietrich laughed. His dimples and full lips gave his otherwise chiseled face a boyish appearance. Oh, Conrad, you have no idea what you're talking about. 
Jacob pays me far more than anyone else would for the job I do. He allows me to make my own hours so I can attend track practice. And the man works far harder than he would ever expect or even allow me to. They walked in silence for a few moments. Conrad had seen the anger flash in Dietrich's eyes when he criticized the Jews, and for a split second, a finger of fear tickled his spine. Dietrich could be a powerful force. Conrad had witnessed that a few months ago when the two boys had been in the park and some older boys taunted Conrad. Without a trace of trepidation, Datrick confronted the boys, hurling several punches at one of them and sending the others running for cover. Then he'd turned on Conrad, who was relieved that the fight had ended without his participation. Bullies are only strong in numbers. As soon as one went down, the others backed off, because none of them could truly stand on their own. Conrad never popular, had come to rely on Dietrich's help. Since childhood, his clumsy body and lack of self-confidence had made him a target for the type of boys who group together and instinctively find the weakest child to terrorize. Only by torturing the pathetic do people of this nature find that they can hide their shortcomings. Because of Dietrich's independence, gangs of angry, oppressive young men tried to recruit him. When they came offering friendship, Dietrich just laughed, refusing. This flippant attitude ignited a strange jealousy in Conrad that he could not explain. Although these gangs of boys disliked Conrad and hurt his feelings as often as possible, he still vied for their approval, while Dietrich came by it without any effort at all. Not only did they shower him with their acceptance, but their admiration as well. Conrad often wondered how it was that Dietrich never felt the desire to become a part of these groups of popular boys, while he longed for their acceptance. Carefully, Conrad spoke. Dietrich, tonight there is a rally in the center of town. I thought you might like to go. The speaker is a man, a new leader that everyone is talking about. He dropped the butt of his cigarette and smashed it with the toe of his shoe. His name is Adolf Hitler. This concludes another episode of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. Thanks for joining me, your host, Benjamin Douglas for another indie author reading. If you liked what you heard, be sure to visit http colon slash slash thebookspeakspodcast.wordpress.com for more episodes and for links to the author's website and the author's Amazon author page in the show notes. If you'd like to follow me on my own author journey, you can find me at http colon slash slash benjamin douglas books dot wordpress dot com and of course if you're an indie author interested in having your work featured on the show or if you're interested in discussing having your book read and produced by me as an audiobook feel free to contact me at benjamin douglas books at gmail dot com Thanks for joining me today. I hope you have a productive and enjoyable weekend.